Um, so what I'll do, well, first of all, to pick up on, on uh, what Greg said, is we do appreciate everyone who supports the Washington Policy Center and contributed to our staffable campaign, because that has allowed us to put together the staff that you're going to hear from tonight. And uh, as the person who directs the research program and oversees all of the publications that we put out, uh, I've been really impressed and pleased with the caliber of the people that we've been able to recruit, because after all, a think tank is just... It's just human capital. It's just that's the only product that we have is our intellectual ability to think through public issues and then present that in a way that communicates with people around the state. And you'll see if you look at any of our uh, published products or if you see our analysts speaking on TV, we try to present complicated issues in a very simple way that people can understand. Um, I'm going to give an, a quick overview of what's happening with the state budget, but I won't go into detail because we have a budget expert. Jason, and he will give some of the details about what the latest revenue forecasts are and what he sees happening in the next budget cycle. What I'm going to do is just is touch on uh, broad themes and particular, particularly looking ahead to later this year as to we, what we see developing in Olympia right now, which will affect how the budget and possibly a tax increase is presented later in the year. So a little bit of what I'll be talking about is predictions about the future. So you've heard a lot about a $9.5 billion deficit in Olympia that they're wrestling with. And one thing that we do is try to put that number into perspective. One thing we point out is that there are seven states across the country that do not have budget deficits. They're not in a tremendous bond. So we really reject this idea that state legislators were overwhelmed by a tremendous tsunami, this perfect storm of economic conditions that hit them with this huge deficit. So that's the first point we make. The second point we make is that the deficit that exists uh, is the result of, of spending decisions in the past. And we would argue overspending. So the state over the last two budget cycles, and, and Jason has a great table that lays all this out, uh, really overcommitted. And every time that the legislature decides to spend a dollar on a public program, they're basically committing to spend that dollar again and again and again indefinitely into the future. They relied on very optimistic economic growth numbers to maintain the flow of revenue coming into the treasury. And these are increases so that, that revenue would continue to increase at the rate they were expected, that they had become accustomed to, I'll put it that way, and when the economy began to go bad, the rate of revenue increase leveled off. And again, Jason will give the details of how our revenue is going flat or maybe slightly declining. So from that base, we think, okay, what we try to look ahead and see what lawmakers are going to do next. And by the way, this is not my speech. This is a, a blog put up by Senator Adam Klein, and this is what we do for fun around the Washington Policy Center. I have to read through it, and you know, you make, you, yeah, make careful notes about everything that he says. He's a very liberal, democratic senator. And so this is a way, a best way to get inside the heads of leaders in the legislature to see what they're projecting. He's the one that describes this scenario I said of where the legislature was just hit by the economy and there's nothing that they could do about it. I thought it was ironic that since the president has announced the age of responsibility, there's an entire paragraph in here devoted to explaining why the legislature is not responsible. For <laughs> so what are they going to do? Next week, the Senate and the House will put out their versions of the budget. We already know pretty well in advance that they're going to be huge, what they'll describe as cuts. So the first thing that we'll do is to check to see whether it's a real cut, a reduction in the number of dollars spent this in the next budget cycle, which starts on July 1st, compared to the current one. So a, a decline in dollars, or even accounting for inflation, that's a real cut. I think there are cases where that might occur. But in general, uh, many programs are probably going to receive increases, so we'll point that out. Um, but it will be presented as terrible, draconian cuts in um, the most valuable programs, education, public health, um, uh, cuts in number of higher, of edu uh, higher education slots at colleges and universities. The number they're putting out is 10,000 slots are going to be cut, which creates the image that 10,000 students are going to lose their positions at their universities. And again, we'll show that those are probably positions on paper, they're not actual people. Um, and, but the purpose of that, and there are some real doomsday scenarios here, I won't go through all, all of them, but uh, it, right in this blog right here, Senator Klein says that these, these cuts, unless the public supports a tax increase, these cuts in public health are going to result in suffering and death for the people who are on the program. A few days ago, about a week ago, Frank Chop, the Speaker of the House, said during a TV a hearing that was covered on TVW, he says, if we don't find funding for these programs, quote, people will die. 
So this is the kind of language that was already beginning to come out, and you can expect to hear a lot more of this. Um, another activist, this is a person who works for a labor union, said, if we don't have funding for public health programs and, uh, and uh, elder health care, uh, those who care for your grandmothers, your parents, your children's friends, these are, they're all going to be cut off. So it is this kind of disaster scenario. So the solution to that, and the message that we're going to be promoting, is that their legislators are engaging in what we call reverse budgeting. That is, they fund low priority items first, and then leave health care and education out there with, with the cuts, so-called cuts. And then there is definitely a tax package in the works that will be put on the ballot, uh, probably sometime in November. And that leaves the entire summer to create this public debate, this atmosphere that I'm talking about. So that'll be our focus over the next several months, is to apply an analysis, an analysis to what's actually happening with the budget and try to show the people of Washington State that these terrible cuts that are going to lead to suffering and death actually uh, are not real. And we have examples of where these same kind of predictions were made in the past. And I'll give you the main example. When the car tab tax was reduced 10 years ago, the same Firehouses were going to close, uh, children's flu shots were going to be canceled, schools were going to become unsafe, there would be an increase in crime, a thousand policemen were going to be laid off. All those predictions were made in 1999, and none of them happened. Okay, and We followed up and measured the numbers and showed that they didn't happen. So we're expecting to see that same kind of debate again, and uh, we'll, we'll be involved as we get into the summer and the fall. So 